right, hello everyone. Welcome to our virtual event space. So my name is Allie and I'm your host for this evening. And I am so excited to be introducing Sean David Hutchinson and Kathleen Glasgow here to discuss their new books, Before We Disappear and You'd Be Home Now. Uh, but before we get into the good stuff, I just want to quickly thank you all so much for tuning in. As much as we miss having you all in the bookstore, it has been such a delight to expand this online program to connect readers and authors in a virtual space. So thank Thank you all so much for tuning in and buying books. Your support is what makes all of this possible. Uh, so I will be linking books directly in the chat all evening, so it'll be super easy to go track them down. Uh, for all of you in the Seattle area, come on in. All three of our locations are open, or you can place an order online and come pick them up in store. Or if you're not local, we do ship. And once again, we are so, so, so grateful for your support. Uh, while you're over on our website, I definitely encourage you to check out some of our other upcoming events. We have an exciting roster coming up in the next few months, and if you'd like to stay in touch with our community, you can sign up for our newsletter. It's a weekly update about events and exciting releases, our online book clubs, and of course, you can follow us on any of the major social media platforms. We are at Third Place Books for the quickest updates and recommendations, uh, and you know, we have a pretty good time over on our social media, so definitely go and check those out and see if there's anything there for you. Uh, speaking of social media, if you'd like to check out some of our other past virtual events. Um, you can find them on our YouTube channel, including this event in the next 48 hours. So if you'd like to see our other virtual events or share this one, go ahead and track those down over there. Uh, we are here for about an hour. And towards the end, we will be taking questions. So if you have any questions, which we very much hope that you do, go ahead and leave those in the Q&A box, which should be either at the top or bottom of your screen. It is different than the chat box, which is great for virtual applause and connecting with each other. Uh, we'd love to know where you are from or your favorite latest read. Uh, but when it comes time for questions, do make sure those end up in the Q&A so we can most easily find them. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone of our commitment to sharing, uh, to ensuring the safety and well-being of event attendees and our guest authors. So in our chat and question spaces, please do lead with kindness and refrain from any inappropriate behavior or harassment. Uh, there are auto-generated closed captions available from the menu at the top or bottom of the screen. Select the live transcript button in order to enable or disable them. And finally, should any technical issues arise, which, you know, it could happen. Uh, we will work as quickly as we can to resolve them, and we appreciate your patience and understanding. And I believe that that is all of my housekeeping. So without further ado, I am so thrilled to introduce Sean David Hutchinson, author of numerous wonderful books for young adults, including We Are the Ants, A Complicated Love Story Set in Space, and the YA memoir Brave Faith. Uh, his newest novel, Before We Disappear, which came out on Tuesday, so happy book birthday, is a queer A historical fantasy set during the 1909 Seattle, Alaska, Yukon Pacific Exposition, where the two assistants of two ambitious magicians find themselves falling in love despite their rivalry. And our second author tonight is Kathleen Glasgow, New York Times bestselling author of Girl in Pieces, You'd Be Home Now, and How to Make Friends with the Dark. Her books have been named to best of lists by the New York Public Library, EW.com, Teen Reads, Barnes and Noble, and a bunch more. Her newest book, You'd Be Home Now, which came out on Tuesday as well, so it's a double feature book birthday, um, is about a town ravaged by the opioid crisis and a teenage girl struggling to find herself amidst the fallout of her brother's addiction. So thank you both so much for being here. I am so excited to listen in on this conversation. If you need anything, I will be listening, so give me a shout. And that same goes for all of you in the audience. I see you all have discovered chat. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass you to our authors. So welcome, both of you. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, so. thank you all. And I, I'm sorry I didn't have a book to hold up. I haven't, I haven't actually gotten any yet. Oh my gosh. So, you know, shipping delays know. are real. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, I got to see them yesterday and they're beautiful, but I got your book because <laughs> I was just like, well, if I can't have mine, I can have yours. And look at this, look at this beautiful cover. You know, funny thing about the, about the cover was that uh, Delacorte, the U.S. publisher had, and if people want to know about 
covers, you should ask us questions. They had a whole different thing and it was like a girl on top of a town, like resting her head. And this cover is actually the UK cover and they sent it to me and I was like, oh, this is nice. I'll just send it to my agent so she knows. And then my agent was like, wait a minute. And she sent it to my editor and my editor was like, oh, that's the cover. Cause she's, they <laughs> thought it like stylistically it matched girl in pieces a lot. And yes. they, they were like, let's just make them all look the same. So in case anyone's wondering, you don't actually, I don't anyway, I don't really get a choice in cover. Like, <laughs> they act like you do, like, how do you like it? But really, they're like, no, this is going to be it. I don't know if Sean's experience has been different. Um, well, it's been, so this is, so before we disappear is actually book number lucky 13. Yeah. Um, and so I actually, just in case, because I was like, well, I want people to be able to see the cover because, you know, so this is actually the cover. It's, so um, it's like, and it's super pretty because the, like on the actual book cover, like parts of it are like shiny, the like, you know, glossy kind of thing. And so it, it gives it depth, but yeah, like my experience with book covers has been like really, really good. Um, I always get input and, and I've always been able to sort of say like, you know, yes, I like this or no, I don't like this. Um, or I don't know that I've ever pushed it though. <laughs> like, I don't know that I've ever pushed it to like, you know, where like, I hate this. Um, and, and ask for a change because I've been, you know, really, really lucky. Like the, the cover designer um, at, at Simon & Schuster and Harper Teen have both, like, they've just been amazing. Um, so yeah, I, and it, I don't know, it's, it's been a good experience. I don't want to jinx it, like knock on <laughs> It's been such a good experience so far. Um, you know, covers are such a mixed bag. They can, I, they can be a mixed bag. They can, they can be. I think you, you've always had like you said, like beautiful covers. So one thing that I really want to ask you about, so Sean, this is your 13th. <laughs> oh my God, Sean. That I'm is, tired. That is, that is amazing. You are a career writer now. Like that is thir how we'll did see. you get to 13 books? Because every time <laughs> I write a book, I'm like, I don't think I have another book in me. And I don't know if that's uh, the same for other people or not. Well, I mean, it's honestly, it's it's half um, half inspiration and, and half panic. Um, as I think, you know, we, we had talked about on Twitter, you know, we were talking about what inspires you to write and you said deadlines. And and, and actually, that's, that's kind of the way it is. Um, no, I mean, it, it's one of those things where I've been, you know, exceptionally lucky in that uh, the the first books, you know, the first two books that I wrote weren't particularly um, well received, <laughs> and and I don't know, kind of rightfully so. Uh, I don't know that I was ready to be publishing, and so I had a lot of catching up to do. But really, it's just I just have a lot of I'm like that that character in um, and uh, Mean Girls, like I just have a lot of feelings, um, and, <laughs> and and so I just you know I, I have a lot of ideas and. Um, Actually, book number 14 comes out in February, so. <laughs> One of the, like, I will always remember the tweet that you made where, and I can't remember which book it was, but you said, it's been seven years and I have earned out on this book. And like, do you remember that? And that means yeah. a lot to me because, you know, books find their readers, readers find the books. And as long as they have like a slow and sometimes steady life out there and word of mouth they're doing what they're supposed to do yes. and, it, and I feel like there's so much pressure on like your first week sales and three month mark do you know and I'm like that's you know we're readers that's not the point of it and right. you know, that like that was a really important tweet for me to read because it's like yeah well I mean I think you know we all get like that right like I mean I find books years after yeah. Like after, uh, you know, they've come out and then you fall in love with them. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think it's like a, a sort of recent in like the last, you know, 15, 20 years that the, the sort of, you know, cause it publishing used to be based on like, you know, the long tail, like publishers made their money 
on, you know, the backlist on, you know, the sales that slowly came in. And, and it feels recent to me that the, the need for like these big numbers right away, um, has, has, you know, sort of taken control. And I don't, I don't really know like what, you know, you do with that, but I have been really lucky, uh, that, you know, uh, Simon Pulse is not an imprint anymore, but that I have, I have worked with a, with publishers that, you know, were willing to sort of like, I did just enough, like I squeaked in and, you know, my numbers were just good enough for them to let me have a chance and, and keep growing that audience. And, um, you know, and, and I think that, that I've been really lucky in, in that respect. Um, but I actually have a question. So, because because I'm curious, right? So because before we disappear is is was my first pandemic book, like and and I had written some of it before the pandemic, but for the most part, like the majority of this book and the revisions happened during the pandemic. And I've noticed a lot of people going, "Wow, this is the most hopeful and <laughs> and like lightest book as Sean's ever written." And it was it, a lot of it like was a response to the pandemic. Like I was looking for like happiness and hope and joy wherever I could find it. And so I'm curious, like how that affected your, you know, writing and, and if it affected you'd be home now at all. Well, first I want to say that I think that before we disappear is incredibly fun, which, <laughs> you know, people might not have been expecting from you, but it does have some really, it has some very serious issues in there. And I yeah. think that you toggle those extremely well. Well, thank um, you. So you'd be home now. I'm trying, you know, I don't, I didn't, I think that I revised, I did like one round of copy edits during the pandemic. So it wasn't written during that, but I did, hmm. I did co-write another book with someone like right yes. in the middle of the pandemic. And that was actually the, the best thing I could have done. And, and that book too, like you're saying, it has a really fun vibe to it and it was something that got me out of bed in the morning because we did a dual POV and so we would trade a chapter a day like she would finish hers and send it to me at night and I'd wake up in the morning read what she did and then do mine and send it to her and we were committed to making it uh, mostly like a fun story that people would want to read and I've never written like that before or written with someone else and I, I think that a lot for a lot of people maybe the books that they were doing exactly during the pandemic they kind of have that vibe but I'm curious to see what happens like in a year or two with books that are being published that maybe have kind of a different attitude towards the pandemic or how that's affected because it's going to have to show up in books at some point as oh yeah pandemic, you know what I mean yeah oh I mean like because my like the book that I wrote after this is I mean, it goes from probably like the lightest, happiest book I've ever written to probably the darkest book I've ever written, um, you know, and it, and it was because, I mean, after I finished Before We Disappear, I mean, like I went into some very bad places because, you know, it was coming in like we were we were in the in the fall and, and the winter and, and we were having that really big spike and waiting for the vaccine. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. I mean, and it has nothing to do with the pandemic. It's a monster book, you know, but it was just like, this is, this is not a fun place. And I am also too curious. Like I saw uh, the mention of the pandemic in a book. Um, it was the first time I'd seen it. And I was just like, mm, no, thank you. Like, <laughs> like, I mean, I, I, luckily it was just like a, it was like a brief mention and, and I was able to like skip over it, but I was like, I don't, I'm not ready for all that. Um, but I, I, I mentioned that on Twitter, somebody had asked that. And I was just like, I'm just pretending in books that didn't exist. Yeah. And it turns out like there are a lot of people who are really sort of interested in reading about it and reading, um, you know, what the reaction is. And so I'm, I'm, I find that fascinating. <laughs> I think, that, you know, because people will want to process something and like reading is a way that they'll process it. But I mean, you know, pandemics and pandemic like occurrences have been in books for years like sci-fi dystopian you know sometimes there's a great illness or a mass plague that happens or something and I, I i'll just be interested to see like if it's directly i think there's one book that's coming out where it's directly explored where these two people two kids fall in love online during the pandemic hmm. so, you know that would be kind of sweet like i would like that it's just so it's so hard it was weird because 
like the sales for my second book, How to Make Friends with the Dark in paperback, like improved. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And then I realized, oh, because this is a book about a girl whose mother dies and kids are losing people. Mm -hmm. And they're going to need books like in that way to yeah. sort of think about. And that's going to be a huge commonality between a lot of kids as they keep going on that they will say well, I lost my brother or my uncle or my grandfather during the pandemic and they'll say me too yeah yeah it's something I wish that so many people didn't have in common I wish that as well I just I don't know okay so the first thing I want to ask you <laughs> before we go like way off <laughs> so, before we disappear, like I'm always in awe of writers who can tackle like a very large canvas, like historical fiction. And I know that this is, you know, a fantasy. 1909, this exposition, like how, I know you had to have done <laughs> so a lot of research for this and then like, you know, molded it into what you needed it to be so how did you even come up with this story um so i had actually it was it's based on a short story that i had written called the phoenix and the butterfly and it was set in london at that time and and so when i decided to turn it into a whole novel um i had just moved to seattle and you know one of the things that that i had done when i moved here was to really explore where i was because i'd lived in florida for my whole life up to then almost and and so I was really exploring Florida. Well, a mile from where I live, well, there were two things. One, one is, uh, <laughs> so for the first year and a half that I lived here, directly across the street from me, they were renovating a high school. Yeah. And, and so it was construction noises from, you know, like 6.30 in the morning until seven o'clock at night. And so I was annoyed about it. And so I decided to look it up and research it. And that school was around, I believe in 1904. And so that really started me thinking about, you know, the history of it. And then I learned, you know, at the, the University of Washington campus, uh, about a mile from where I live is where the uh, Seattle World's Fair was held. And so I just started like reading about that and then, you know, walk around and, and, you know, see where it was and, you know, you still get a feel like, I, and that's one of the things that I firmly believe is like when you walk around places, like you can feel the history. Yeah. Um, and so I just like really felt that history. And, and so, you know, I pitched it and, you know, uh, my editor, Harper Teen was like, yes, like, yes, please. And um, so, yeah, so I started the research and, and I did a lot of the research, um, you know, uh, in libraries and, and uh, the, who is it now? Library of Congress has digitized a lot of newspapers. So I read, <laughs> I read a lot of newspapers um, to, to get a feel for the time. Um, and then I had like, my house was a, a wreck for a while because I found all these digitized pictures from the, the, you know, Alaska Pacific Yukon exposition and I printed them out. And so I had them all over my walls. So I was constantly surrounded by what things look like, um, you know, advertisements and, and everything. And, um, because the thing that I wanted to do is like, I call it a historical and I call it a fantasy. The fantasy part is that there's magic. And the a historical part is that when I pitched this, I said, you know, the only big change I want to make in history is that I don't want there to be any, you know, homophobia. Like I want, right just, you know, happy queer people. And I know that, that that is not historically accurate. And, um, so yeah, so I dove into that and then the pandemic happened and I lost access to like the majority of, of my primary sources. So everything like, you know, was like, I have to find it online. Um, and balancing it was, oh my goodness, I have to see the doggy. It's, it's, it's the zoom rule. Oh, <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, just like finding that world and, and my editor, uh, Dave, was just really instrumental in helping me make, you know, the Seattle World's Fair feel like a character without, you know, overwhelming with the world building, you know, um, yeah. constantly he would be like, You're, you've said a lot here, but I'm still not like feeling it. And so it was like trying to to make you feel the exposition without overwhelming you with, with every single world building um, detail and um yeah it was 
It was a lot. Like uh, one of the big challenges that like I really wanted to tackle was was this idea that um, uh, you know, like I have I had sort of eliminated homophobia from from this world. But you know, a lot of my characters are women. And one of uh, my two main characters, best friend in the story is a black girl. Mm -hmm. And so you have sexism and racism. And I didn't feel like it was my place to erase those from this world because it's not really my place to do that. At the same time, I also didn't feel like it was this thing where I was like, okay, well, I've erased homophobia, but everyone else has to suffer unless they're a white man. So one of the things that I was able to, to do was, was, you know, through research was find these spaces of, of joy for everyone, you know, find the historical sort of, of record so that, um, you know, sexism exists, but it is not this you know, overwhelming thing in the story, you know, where you've got these successful women running their, their lives and, and doing things that a lot of women couldn't do. And you have, you know, Black characters who are, you know, experience racism because it exists, but it is not an overwhelming, awful thing um, because, you know, you're finding these spaces. And, and one of the interesting things I read, it was the, the Seattle Republic a Seattle Republican, but it's a black owned newspaper in Seattle at the time. And so reading every single issue during that time frame to really get an idea of what life was like for black people during that time so that I could find the areas and, and spaces where they existed and had joy and, and work that into the book. Um, and that was a lot of fun to do, you know, to, to find joy in a lot of these. Like, I, and I'll tell this story and then I have a question for you. Um, so one of my, one of the things is, you know, um, the enchantress is Jack's magician. And, and she is, uh, you know, she is a woman who does what she wants. And of course, that was not really the thing in 1909. And so when I was looking for examples of, of you know, women who did what they wanted, there was this great story about this, uh, this dancer who danced, they called it the coochie coochie dance. And it was basically like a belly dance, you know, yeah. she was like a belly dancer. And, um, and she was in court, you know, because for, um, uh, for dancing in public. And the, there was like a transcript portion in the newspaper and the judges were questioning her and she kept like shaking her hips and they were like, madam, don't shake your hips in this courtroom. And like, you could just feel through the page, just the scandal that she was shaking her hips. And it was hilarious. And you could also feel just her sort of like laughing at them. And, and it was, you know, it was just this great little thing where I'm like, yeah, like that's, you know, that's where it is. Um, and, and anyway, um, so I actually have a question, and, and this is I want to know is, were you a theater kid? Okay, I, <laughs> I, took, I took a theater class in high school. Okay. I really loved it. Like, I loved it so much. But then I was expelled, and so, <laughs> and I didn't take another one after it. But I, my favorite, uh, my favorite form of medium is actually to go see live theater and I miss it like I so I, then you are a theater kid I, I love I love the excitement and intensity and anticipation of watching a play I love all of it I love watching people pretend to be other people and you believe it and I love the stories and I I I love it so maybe I'm like I'm like a, I'm the theater kid in the back of the theater <laughs> <laughs> I just but love it Okay, so how did you take that and work that? Because so I actually know, and, and I, I, I think you should tell this story of how this, how this book came about, because I remember you telling me this last time, um, is how you came to write You'd Be Home. And how did you take, you know, that intensity of the theater, the, the idea of, you know, people being other people and turn that into an amazing book? Like, how did you get there? So my editor... Um, one day asked me, have you ever thought of updating our town as a contemporary YA? And I, I was like, what? That would be weird. Because, you know, usually I have my own ideas. And, and I said, you know, because I, I love 
that play. Like, mm -hmm. I love it. And so I, I was a little hesitant at first because I, I was like, well, I don't, I don't know if I can write even like loosely from somebody else's source material. And that's such a beloved play in so many ways. But I decided to try because the, there's a moment in there when um, Emily asks her mother, like, why can't you ever really see me, Mama? You never really see me. And that resonated with me because I, I feel like teens rarely think that their parents actually see them for who they are, like right there in the moment. They just see them as, you know, what they're hoping they'll become someday. And that really resonated, resonated with me. And so I, you know, I worked on a couple of drafts and I had to think about how to translate some things from the play. And if people aren't familiar with the play, it, it takes place in Grover's Corners, New Hampshire. And there's a character named the stage manager who breaks the wall and he can speak to the audience. And he also knows the past and the future of the town and all the characters in the play. And it was like, well, how am I gonna do that? In this book. And so I decided to turn the stage manager into Miss Educated, who writes these poems on Instagram about how they feel about life. And the kids in the town then can respond in the comments about how they really feel about what it's like to be a teenager in the town that I call Mill Haven. And then at one point I was very stuck because my editor had said, and I think that my editor was right. Um, you know, this town would probably be decimated by the opioid crisis. And I truly do believe that if Thornton Wilder wrote this play today, the opioid crisis would be in there because, you know, he tackled like suicide and alcoholism in our town. And so he probably, it would be in this. And so I got really stuck at one point and I couldn't, I was like, and I'd never really been that stuck with a book before. And that's when my editor said, you know, you're, you're trying too hard to put everything from the play into the book in book form. You can move on now. It's going to become its own story. And I felt so free. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always write better when no one is looking, if that makes sense. Like I, like, yes. you know, your first book, no one really knows you're writing it. You don't have right. an agent and you don't have an editor. You don't have a contract or a deadline or a book deal. And there's a real freedom in that. And so I, I write better when I don't actually ask them what they want. I just start writing it. And then they say, okay, where's your, like, the book? And I'm like, oh, here's your track. <laughs> like, honestly, I mean, my editor is really good about that. And so as soon as she said that, I felt free. And then I could put in elements that I wanted to put in. And I kept the theater aspect because there is, you know, Simon is in our town. And I wanted to keep that. And I wanted Emery to have the experience of having to use someone else's voice before she was strong enough to find her own. And I feel like you can do that in theater. And when I took that theater class, like I distinctly remember my teacher when I was performing a monologue in front of everyone, which was terrifying. <laughs> and afterwards she said, you know, that was good, but I still, I still see too much of you in this. And I thought that was really interesting. And I was like, oh, she's giving me permission to completely become somebody else and what a great thing that is yeah so theater is so such a great outlet and i'm you know i'm very worried for people who are like theater kids like reading those scenes in this book and being like no no thank you <laughs> that's not what happens that's not the way it is and so the only way i could get away from that was to have simon in the book later on actually say i'm not very good <laughs> <laughs> You know, though, like theater is its own sort of like, I, I don't know, I think it's a different experience for everybody, right? Like, I mean, it, like, as with everything. And, you know, it's really interesting, you know, that your your teacher said that about your monologue, because I remember and, and I wrote about this in, I don't know if I wrote about it exactly like this, but I wrote about uh, when I, I auditioned for Dracula in uh, ninth grade. And I did this monologue from, you know, uh, uh, it was a Renfield monologue and it was just all this like completely unhinged, you know, thing. And it, it got me the role. And I remember like tapping into something and then never being able to do it again because I was always so self-conscious and never able to get out of, of that again. 
Um, There's a real safety in taking on a persona. Yeah. And then, you know, I feel like too, maybe that's why we ended up being writers is because we can hide behind our characters. Yes. And they're, they're basically our personas in some way. Yeah. We can, like be in charge of the action there and the plot and the story. Yes. And it's also, it's, a, it's an interesting way to, I don't know, live other lives in, in kind of a way, you know, um, experience things that, you know, you, you maybe to, you know, like I, I love writing about uh, characters, especially like teen characters who are more uh, free with, uh, you know, gender expression. Because when I was growing up, like it was a very rigid, you know, sort of thing. And, you know, and so characters who are able to express themselves more than I love writing that, you know, because it was something I never got to do when I was a kid. Um, and it's, it's a great thing to do. Um, I think, you know, I like that we can, when we, like, we're writing like you and I, we can do the things that we wish had been done in books when we were that age. And I, yeah. I think that's a really important thing to do is kind of right some wrongs in a way and I think it's but the other like you know when people always ask you particularly if you're writing young adult books like why are you writing young adult books and we all say well we we want to write for teens so that they have these books where they can see themselves but lately I've just really been saying you know what I just want to write like writing is my thing it's always mm -hmm. been my thing and I'm attracted to these stories about adolescents, but it's just my thing. <laughs> I don't I don't know what else I would do. It's always been the only thing that I wanted to do. How about you? Yeah, no, I mean, and it's absolutely it. And you know, and I do have aspirations to write in other age groups and other, yeah. you know, in other genres and and but the thing about it is, is I mean, like A, you know, I I think that, you know because being 18 was in a way very traumatic, there is always going to be a part of my mind that is sort of frozen at that age. So, yeah. you know, like I have moved on personally, but I can still remember very distinctly yeah. what it was like. Um, but the other thing is, is I like writing for teens um, yeah. because they're, <laughs> they're really the greatest audience, you know? And they are are so just honest about what they like and what they don't like and what works and what don't works. And when they love something, they love it with their whole hearts. Yeah. And there's just, there's something so pure and wonderful about that. Um, and, and they're, they're completely honest. Like they're very receptive to all sorts of things that you yeah. might put in there. And then they're honest if they liked it or didn't, they're just honest. And they're like ready for all sorts of information if you give them the chance. Yeah. Even if they're quiet about it in the real world, like in books, they are like, I can explore this in a book because maybe I'm not like ready to talk about it yet or I don't have the language to talk about it, but this book is making me believe that these things could be a part of my life someday. And I, I think that's a really, like it's a powerful thing. And I, you know, I feel like I write for teens too in a way because I'm, permanently stuck at like 15 or 16 even though I'm an adult and I have some tools now to manage stuff but I can still viscerally feel like what that like what some of those how painful some of those things were right. and I, I think that some adults forget that sometimes oh yeah definitely and I even like I I kept like my teenage journals and so sometimes <laughs> I will go back and read them when I'm thinking about something or a character just to sort of really get back in that space. And it's, even though I didn't feel great about myself at the time, reading my journals, I was like, oh, you, you were actually pretty cool. Like you were really questioning a lot of things and you were really, you had like these big hopes and dreams and you really wrote about stuff. And I wish that, you know, probably if me now went to talk to me then, me then would not say anything, but would probably just keep reading a book in the corner being like, why is this <laughs> talking to me? <laughs> so. You know, like, I, I mean, that's one of the things is, you know, 
and and of course I love you know that adults are reading YA, but one of the things that bugs me is that they don't seem to take the 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 teen readership as seriously as as I wish they would, you know, because you see things like oh insta love or oh why are they so upset about a breakup? And I'm like, do you not like remember what your first breakup was like? I do, and it felt like the end of the world, you know. I like when they get angry about like two characters instantly falling in love. It's like. I fell in love like a billion times a day. Yes. You know, like all, like everything is very instantaneous and in the moment when you're a teenager, you know, there is no, like, nothing is gray. It's black or white. Like it's very intense. Yes. yes. And all the time, like kids like hook up, break up, get back together, meet some, I mean, and it's intense. You're like, I love you. And so. And it's real. Like, and as far as I'm concerned, like it's real. It's and real. I think that that's like, that's kind of like, our responsibility is to to take their feelings, you know, uh, to to take them seriously. And I do, like, and I know you do too. Is it's it's not like oh ha 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 the silly teens, you know, they fall in love. It's like no, like this is a real thing, and no. and I take this seriously, you when know. You and fall in love as a teenager, you were like, I'm so in love. I mean, it's very intense, and and you know, then adults who are like, oh, these teens are making such bad choices, and I'm like, of course you. I don't know if they're bad choices, but they're the choices you make at that age for yes. some people, and they're entirely age appropriate. And that's what the only way you learn and mature is by making choices that perhaps are not the best at the time. And then yeah. later you'll be like, I probably shouldn't have done that. So <laughs> I don't know. And then I'm just like, you know, there's a whole other section of the bookstore and library for you <laughs> if you choose to go over there. Well, and like even not even the bad choices. It's I I see them. You know, they talk about the good choices. Like, oh, there's no way that these teens would be saving the world and doing that stuff. And then you look at people like you know, like like these these young people who are out there doing things that not even I'm out there doing. You know, and I'm like, yeah, no, they are. Like they're they I I could see that. You know, I could see some of these things. And they don't, um, they don't think teens can be smart. Right. And, but like, even if, like, even if what they believed were true, like, even if, you know, like teens wouldn't be out there saving the world, like, like it's aspirational to me, you know, like, yeah. like you don't always have to write exactly the way things are. Sometimes it's enough to write about like things the way you want to be. And I think like teens want to see themselves doing these things because it's not like adults are making the best choices right now. Okay. So the... the <laughs> The element of magic in Before We Disappear. So I want you to talk about how how you made this world of magic. Like, was there magic research? Did you make everything up? Because like, there's real magic and then there's fabricated magic. Yeah, so the, so the stage magic, I did do a lot of research, um, but at the end of the day, I took an awful lot of liberties too. Um, because one of the things that I wanted to do was I, I took the, the idea, the stagecraft of stage magic very seriously and was not going to like reveal the tricks and how they're done, um, you know, because I wanted there to be that element. But of course I also did things that I don't know that you could have gotten away with on stage. Um, but I, I really tried to make them seem plausible um, and, and based on uh, real tricks that I did read about. And then there's the fantasy magic, which I think is just sort of a, a Sean trait, you know, where like there's something weird in this world that I'm probably never going to explain, um, <laughs> but, but it happens and you just have to like go with it. Um, but really like I, I, you know, because, so I don't know if, in the story, Wilhelm is the character who can do actual magic, and he is uh, a captive of somebody who is using him and what he can do. And so for me, it was that juxtaposition of, you know, his his magic, his ability is, it's, it's like Nightcrawler in X-Men, like he can, you know, travel distances, uh, like in an instant. And so to me, it was that juxtaposition of he can go anywhere, and yet he is trapped in in this life that he doesn't want to be in by this man who, you know, says he loves him, but clearly does not. Um, and, and that was kind of like, that was actually one of the things that I, I don't want to say I enjoyed it, but that I worked really hard on was, you know, was the adult figures. 
because there's the Enchantress and there's Laszlo and, and Laszlo is a fake, you know, it's, it's like, he's even got like, you know, his fake, like, you know, like European sounding name, even though, you know, um, he's got, his real name is Teddy, you know, <laughs> like, so he is, he is like mayonnaise on white bread, white. So, you know, and, um, and like, then you have the Enchantress who is this, just sort of like sultry, like powerful woman who is manipulative in her own way and cruel in her own way. And, you know, and where Wilhelm sees Teddy for who he really is, Jack thinks the Enchantress really loves him. And, you know, and, and in a way they're both trapped by, by these things. And so, yeah, it was, it was a really interesting thing. And, and um, to me, you know, the, the, the the real magic was uh the the uh, the heist at the end of of the story because i, I was, yeah how did you like go about orchestrating that <laughs> very carefully um i actually so it was it was actually funny is is people who read an early arc may have scratched their heads a little bit because yeah. there was there was a, a a very very end proofread where i went oh crap I messed something up and I had to like very quickly write some stuff uh, to fix something that, that I had done. Cause I'll tell you what, like editing and revising a pandemic novel is, is difficult. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just a lot of like uh, note cards on walls and, and trying to make everything, you know, work. And then of course, you know, there's some like hand wavy actual magic that I was able to use to to bridge the gaps between the actual heist stuff and and I was paranoid and I still am that people are going to be like there's no way that heist could have happened but so far the the response to the heist has been you know good so you know if there's another oceans movie give me a call I'll I'll put together a really bad heist you know the whole thing about like heist is that they're fantastic and so people are like that could have never happened that way are completely right. missing the point right the sheer fantasticness of what's happening unfold you know unfolding in front of you and so well and i still you know like i guess the thing is it's always like you you like you always want to find those like where is it like where plausibility meets yeah. like plot yeah. you know like you want it to feel plausible while still feeling fantastical um and so like the there, there's a, a magic trick at the end and it's called the phoenix and it's basically uh jack crawls into a, a box and then they set it on fire <laughs> with him in it and you know and so part of the you know part of the thing that i was looking at i'm like okay well i know that there are things that they could do now but what could they do in 1909 you know how how could they do these things and so you know it was researching um and now i'm going to forget but there was a and it was, I think it was asbestos based, but it was, it was a, uh, a flame retardant that they could, you know, use back then. Um, and, and that he could wear. And yeah. is it plausible that he had a, a tailored suit made out of it? But is it possible? Yes. And, and that's, you know, so that's, that's kind of where we meet with that, but it's cool because they set him on fire. I know, like that's cool, right? like that's cool. Like, I mean, I'm reading that and I'm like, well, this is really, this is like falls out. This is like so cool on the page to read. So, okay, so she, I, well, your I actually editor, had one question. Huh? Is your copy editor like, okay, can they set a suit on fire? Like your copy editor must have been, this must have been uh -oh. a job. It was, and and I was very like, we actually went through, uh, I think like three proofreading yeah. uh, rounds, um, mostly because... I mean, I just made a lot of silly mistakes. Like, uh, you know, the first chapter takes place in 1908. And then, you know, I had set up, you know, like the date or, you know, set up the format, how the city and state, you know, location and everything would say. And I copied and pasted that across some of the later <laughs> chapters. And so like the date was wrong. And then in some chapters, just my, my brain just flipped like, because it, it's the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. And so sometimes I wrote it the Alaska Pacific Yukon yeah. exposition and so it was just little things like that keeping track of them um but i also tried you know to like when i looked something up like um for one of the tricks you know they use a a, a substance called bakelite which is an early yeah. plastic you know and yeah. 
Um, and so when I would do things like I would, I would attach the research that I had used to be like, here is where it, you know, where it was. Cause like, I remember the very first thing that I did, my editor was like, did they really have flashlights then? And I was like, yes. And here is exactly the flashlights that they could have had and, and how they would have worked. Um, you know, just to try and, and make their job a little easier. Yeah. Um, but there were a lot of things, you know, like translating some of the French, uh, in the first chapter and, um, just a lot of little things that. <laughs> we're like it was a lot um and I don't ever want to do a historical again as long as I live I never do um but I wanted to ask you okay so if you could like if you were going to write another book inspired by a play like any play any play what would you choose uh true west really yeah I know that's it's the play that I've seen performed most live okay and it's a play that just endlessly fascinates me hmm. because things happen, but also things, not a lot happens. And I once met Sam Shepard at this event oh, wow. and he, I read, you know, a lot of his plays and he had just come out with a, a book of short stories, which was really great. And my one question to him was, you know, in your plays, you always have these characters opening the refrigerator door as the stage action. And then they just stare inside what are they looking for? Because they don't take out any food. They're just staring. And he was like, nobody's ever asked me that before. <laughs> I don't, I have no idea. And I was like, well, do they not have any idea? And it's just like that mindless looking in the fridge thing. And he's like, I have no idea. And I've never forgotten that, but probably True West, because I think that the intensity of the relationship in that play, you could translate pretty well to a contemporary um, why, so it would probably be true. Because I'm utterly fascinated by your brain and and how you come up with stories and how, like, seriously, like how you took our town. And I mean, like, uh, it I just, it blows my mind. I and I think to, it takes so much talent. I changed, you know, I changed a lot of things, but there are elements from the, the play in there and like reenactments of certain scenes and, you know, the ghosts in our town that Emily walks along at the end and sees. Those are the ghosties under the bridge in the book. Those are the homeless and the people who are addicted who are living under the bridge. So I had to think about like little elements like that and putting it through. The one thing that I knew that I didn't want to do in this book was have Emily die because, you know, in the play, she dies. And I, I knew that I didn't want that to happen. And I actually, you know, people say that they're crying a lot over the book, which I think is fine. But technically, I think it's one of the gentlest books that I have written so far. Most, it's, you know, like drug use happens off the page, but you see right. effects, people discuss things, but it's mostly discussion. But I felt like it was very, I had to make it this way because we're not getting, usually I write from the perspective of the character who's undergoing the intensity. And this time I wrote it from, a sister's perspective so she's watching it unfold because I thought that people especially kids who are who have addiction in their family or with friends you know they don't know how to deal with it no one really wants to talk about it you just try to pretend that things are normal but you really want to help this person who's struggling then it's really hard to do because part of you is like why can't you just fix yourself and that's not what you should ask people who are struggling in that way. What you should ask them is, what's happened to you? Because the first question is blaming. And the second question is actually asking them about themselves. How did you get to this place? Let's see where we can take you. And I, I just feel like there's so much shame. You know, I'm in recovery, so I feel like there's a lot of shame attached to addiction. And that is not going to help someone out of it or through it and it you know once you're on that road it's a long road and relapse happens and we just need to stop shaming people and as we were discussing before the event you know this is a public health crisis and we really need free health care for everybody in this country and we need to stop ignoring people who are on the street as though they're not connected to us in any way because they are yeah and I, I just think it's very shameful the way that we treat people who have no resources. Yeah. 
that's one of the things that I noticed about moving to Seattle was was an interesting this this feeling amongst the the people here that you know they're so progressive because you know in Florida that you didn't really see many people who were homeless because they put them in jail and and here in Seattle you know they don't do that and they are very you know progressive in that respect but it kind of ends there and I'm like they're patting themselves on the back for going look we leave them on the street but it's like okay but now what you know and 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 you're right addiction to me is part of the mental health you know crisis that we are having and you know if we treated addiction as part of a mental health you know package and then stop stigmatizing mental health like we could fix a lot of our problems you know i once i was in la and the person who was driving the car took me on a tour of the old garment district and it was you've probably seen it in the news it's just like a mile of tent cities outside these warehouses that used to be garment factories and shops that are no longer being used. And those warehouses are empty and right, there right. are people living on the sidewalk outside them. And the person I was with was like, well, the city would like to sell these and, you know, make them condos. And I thought about that a lot when I was writing our town and like, sell it to a nonprofit let these people just walk inside, fix this place up, do it. This is an empty building and you have thousands of people sleeping in a tent outside. Yeah. Like, it's, like it's, a hor have... it's a horrible problem and nobody wants to do anything. Yeah. Well, not nobody, but. <laughs> <laughs> not nobody, but yeah. Anyway. So I'm so sorry to interrupt on that mic drop moment. Um, but we are heading towards the end of our evening, and I just want to grab as many audience questions oh, yeah. as we can. So, um, for starters, we have multiple questions for Sean about baking. So we're just going to lump them together. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Cookie says, which, by the way, hi, Cookie. <laughs> um, welcome welcome back to the audience side of the, the event room. Um so you're a prolific baker. Did you ever consider jumping on the sourdough bread trend during the first few months of lockdown? No, no, I like sweets. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I like sourdough, but I, I don't have a, I don't actually have a starter and I don't even know how to get a starter. So no sourdough bread for me yet. If somebody gave me a starter, I would try it. Why do you need a starter? Because I guess that's the bacteria thing that makes the sour makes it sour. I guess I don't know enough about it. I just know that you have to have a sourdough starter, and like that's what everyone was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. There's one more. This is from Kathy, um, who says you've done some great pandemic baking. Yes. Um, what's one thing you'd like to attempt that you haven't? Ooh, uh, princess cake. The uh, the princess the princess torta I think it is so it's it's cake and then it's jam and it's meringue and more jam and meringue and it's it's got the green marzipan across the top and it's it's very technically challenging and I would love to make one of those but I that haven't sounds. because I just I haven't I haven't been brave enough yet. <laughs> 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 Cookie in the chat says princess cake for Picard night. <laughs> <laughs> so this is from Wendy and this is for Kathleen. Uh, and it says, I'm really curious about the ways in which you researched small town opioid ep epidemics. So partly what I did was I read a lot of um, news stories about the opioid epidemic and I looked up statistics um, and I made up the town of Mill Haven. I did a little bit of research on New Hampshire and older towns there. And I read blogs by recovering addicts. And then I used my own recovery journals because it was important to me to have Joey's perspective on um, how he feels about what's happening to him in the book so that you could know perhaps how he got to that place and his fears about it and his trepidation. Um, I didn't want to do a full-blown thing like get into all the big pharma. I wanted to keep that part of the canvas very small so you, you just see how it affects the family and, and to a larger extent the town. 
so the facts and the statistics that I have in um, the authors noted are correct and the ways that um, people go into treatment are correct. But otherwise I kept that um, pretty small because I don't want to be, it is a book about that, but it's also a book about other things, about a family, most of all. Yeah, it feels like a book about people first. And, yeah. you know, the, the opioid epidemic isn't a character. It is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, I didn't, I didn't want to show, like, Joey doing the drugs because I wanted, right. you could see the effects later on him, but I, I wanted to keep it, like, very, I needed to keep the perspective in that part of the canvas, like, very localized to the family in a way. I don't, because I'm, it's not a book about battling big farmer taking on this huge subject. I had to keep it small. So thank you for that. Um, this is a sort of related question, and it's but it's for both of you. Uh, Cookie asks, how much research for a book is too much research? <laughs> uh, I will just say that uh, if it if you are researching to avoid writing, you've probably done enough research. I think that that is absolutely correct because you can get totally bogged down in a research as a way of avoiding actually having to like write the sentences because your research is so fascinating and you, it just becomes like an avoidance mechanism yeah. at a certain point so and I imagine like Sean you probably had to make like a huge bible too for all your research and like character backgrounds and things like that like you said that you were attaching to like copy edits so they would know yeah but you know we're writers so we could go down the rabbit hole for hours Looking oh, at like the littlest thing. Months, <laughs> months, months we could go down. I'm almost, I don't know about you. Like, so I was almost, and I, not at the time, but retroactively grateful for the pandemic for kind of like cutting me off. Um, because yeah, I mean, I could have gone to primary resources for just ever. And I may not have ever gotten the book done. I did, I did. I reread an article over and over about the relationship between two teenagers, this, this was real life, um, and one of the boys ended up overdosing, and it was an article after the fact interviewing his family and his friend, and the family blamed his friend because his friend kept supplying him with drugs, and I thought about that character a lot when I was writing Luther, because Luther is the one who's like, I'm actually the only one who understands him and accepts him for what he is, and you guys don't actually see him for what he needs, and he's like, he's in a lot of emotion you know a lot of emotional pain and so that was an article that i drew on pretty heavily for the relationship between joey and luther it's not a, it's they are friends like that's all i can say it's not the greatest relationship it's not something to um model but they do love each other but the hero and it's me, real yeah the hero to me of the story is actually uh max devos joey's other friend because he subtly changes his lifestyle so that he can remain Joey's friend. So, also, I had to re research a lot of weather because I don't live in New Hampshire and your copy editor will be like, it's October. Is it really snowing yet? In New and I'm like, oh my God, no. So, I oh, so I'll give you a good thing. So wolframalpha.com right yeah, okay yeah. no so serious so it's like a computational search engine and you can do things like you know so like if you're ever looking in a book and i've used the phase of the moon or the tides or even like usually the weather or things like that sunset sundown you can put in date time location year everything and it will give you you can look up that information so you can go to like you can say like you know what was the phase of the moon on this day this year this time in this place and it will tell you and so yeah so like it's super easy to be like what was the weather during this you know on this day I'm yeah ready. it's amazing <laughs> No, that's genius. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know that existed. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so we are about at the end of our evening and we have a whole bunch of great, great questions still on this list. Uh, so I'm just going to sort of pick the middle one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is from an anonymous attendee and it says, what is an experience you cherish that came directly from writing or as a result of being an author? <laughs> Well, it was meeting Sean David Hutchins. <laughs> <laughs> Who 
one because like I said in the beginning it he was one of the people who influenced me as a person who was writing so you know I cherish that I cherish the the people that I've met who are like generous kind warm and amazing and talented and then me because I bake things no. <laughs> and, you know I've never I make one of I make up for my crappy personality with baking I just you know I'm just I'm just here to make friends. We're all in it yes. for the long haul. I just want to put my head down and do my own work and then cheer my friends on. So I, I think it's, it's. I will say the nicest thing is hearing from readers. Yeah. I mean, and, and I agree with you because it's it's the people that like you that I have met and that, you know, encourage and, and you know, remind me why we do this, you know, um, like that has been such a great thing. Um, and, you know, I mean, get like, cause we were talking earlier is, you know, the last time that I saw Kathleen was at her last book event. And, you know, and, and I wish that we were doing this in person that we could do this in person, you know, and, um, but also like, like I have, like, I don't know, like, I don't like telling other people's stories, but just basically like some of the readers, like meeting some of the readers and hearing some of their stories about the ways, not just like my books, but like even other people's books have affected their lives. And, and that will always be like one of the most meaningful things to get out of this. And I remember when I published Brayface, like I kept telling my editor, I'm like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, I don't like, let's cancel this book. I don't want, like, I don't want to do this. And she would just go like, look, like if one reader like picks this up and it makes them like feel better or it, it helps them recognize themselves. Like, won't that be worth it? And I'm like, like, fine. Yeah. Well, like, fine. Let's keep doing this because, you know, it was a hard book to write and, you know, like getting those emails. Yeah. It made it all worth it. Like the, the emails from the kids who are like, I, I didn't, you know, like they live in small towns. And so they're like, I didn't know people like us existed and yeah. that makes it worthwhile. And they wrote you a letter. Well, email, because nobody knows my address. <laughs> I mean, you know, email is just a letter. They wrote you a letter. Yeah. They sat down and like wrote you a letter because your book impacted them so much. Like, honestly, that is the most amazing thing. I mean, and I know, I'm sure you get letters because your books are real in a way that a lot of books I read aren't. Like they, like they're the... Like sometimes I read books and I'm like, okay, like, you know, in 10 years, nobody's going to read this book and that doesn't make it a bad book. It just, you know, it's a book. Like people are still going to be reading your books 10, 15, 20 years from now. And I, I genuinely believe that because there is something timeless and real about them that just, you know, touches the soul and, and gets to, you know, the heart of, of being a human being. Um, and you are also a human being. <laughs> like. Well, you know what? I want, us, I want us both to be still getting emails 10 years from now and to be on shelves. And I think, you know, that's what really matters. And you said really nice things, so I'm going to try it not to cry. Because yeah. <laughs> I did my makeup in it. <laughs> I think that that was a perfect mic drop moment to end the evening on. <laughs> so, hi, I'm back. <laughs> um, it is about time that we call this a night. So I'm just going to take a quick moment to thank you both so, so much for being here, for sharing with us, for this great discussion. Um, to all of our audience members, thank you so for turning out. We are so happy to have you here, always, always. Uh, for anyone who would like to get their hands on copies of Before We Disappear and You'd Be Home Now, go ahead and follow those links. Go ahead and scroll up just a little bit. I think you're going to have to, um, but those should be right there. Uh, if you're local, of course, come on in, grab a copy. We would love to see you. Um, let us know what you thought about this event, either in person or on social media. We always, always love to hear from you. Sean and Kathleen, one more huge, huge thank you for being here. This has been such, such a pleasure. And with that... I thank think it you. is time. Thank you. Thank you. So you. Thank you for hosting and, you know, <laughs> and just being so supportive. And it's spooky season. It is spooky season. Happy day one. It's the best day. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Shall we let the uh, awkward waving commence?
Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.